Hi everybody, Kate Haley here with Glazer's Camera. Long time no see. Uh, it's been a while since we've done one of these live stream and we're super excited to bring you PhotoFest um, this week. Today marks the first day of PhotoFest. We're doing some online programming this week and on the weekend we have a ton of in-person programming, photo walks, lighting demos, portrait shoots, you name it, we got it. Um, again, we're super excited to bring this uh, back to life a little bit. Mm. It's been a while, which is <laughs> it's kind of weird. Not going to lie, it's a little bit weird. So first of all, I want to thank you all for joining us. And a um, little precursor on how this works. We have an awesome presentation today with a Leica ambassador named Sheila Pre Bright. She's going to be talking about documentary and fine art photography. Just a moment. For those of us, for those of you joining us, I would love to know where you're tuning in from. And I see you putting that in the chat already. But also, during this presentation, if you have questions about Sheila's presentation and her work, please get those posted in the chat. We want to hear from you. We want to be able to ask some of those questions throughout the presentation and, of course, wrap with a little bit of Q&A. But please, please, please put those questions in the chat so that we can have some conversation around the work as well. Um, with that said, I'd love to introduce you to Sheila, and we're going to get this presentation going. Sheila, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing fine. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm glad I had the opportunity for you guys to, um, for Leica Camera as an ambassador and Glacier Photo to speak about my work, you know, documentary and fine art photography. Well, I know I'm really excited to hear the stories that you have to share about the work. Um, a lot of the images that I've seen are just so compelling and, and have those stories built into them. But to hear from you about the work that you've made and are continuing to make is going to be a real, a real joy for us today. So thank you for your okay. time, of course. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to start off telling you a little bit about me so you can understand why I do the work that I do. And I'm going to first start off and talk to you about me. I'm a daughter of a soldier. Um, I grew up in Germany. My first six years of my life and from then we would actually move like every two to three years um, within the United States and I was around diversity a lot and so when I got to college I took a photography course because I'm a very believe it or not I'm a very shy individual I would like stay, I have three other siblings. I would stay in the room and all I would do was read, read, read. And my father would always buy me books. But when I, my last year in college, when I took, I don't know what made me want to do this, but I took a photography course. And this photography course was like photo one. And we had to go out and do a documentary. And I decided to follow a teacher around, um, teacher about education. And from there, when I graduated, I said, hmm, there's something about this photography I really did like. I had one camera, one lens. I moved to Houston, Texas. This is in the 90s. And that's when the part hip hop culture was really developing. But it was, I think, more in the 70s. But I was around the part of gangster rap. And so I had this curiosity and wanted to know why these young black males wanted to be rappers. So I would go out and hang out in Third Ward and I became known as the um, photographer, the photograph, I was photographing promotional photos. And this is one that you see right here and it's called Rich E. Rich. And, I, and these were people that were unknown and I, I have no idea where they're at right now unless they see my imagery and get in contact with me. But rap -a -Lot Records, I don't know if anybody, rap -a -Lot Records saw the work that I was doing and they hired me out to shoot um, Scarface, um, not the Ghetto Boys, um, the Fifth Ward Boys. And so I was known for that. And there was an artist friend of mine came to um, see my work. And he said, did you shoot this? And I'm like, yeah. He said, I need to bring a curator to, to look at your work. But he, because he said, you need to be in a show. I had no idea about what was a gallery, museums, anything like that. So 
the curator came. He looked at the work and he said, you did this work? <laughs> and I'm like, yes. And he wanted me to be in the show. This was my first show in Houston, Texas um, at a gallery. I can't even remember the name of the gallery. And I think, keep this in mind. I didn't go to school for photography. I'm basically self-taught. I decided to um, make these images of these young, I have more on my website. I, I just wanted to show you this one image. I decided that I wanted to place these images in shoeboxes. So what I did was I painted it all black, air, air sprayed them black all on the inside and the outside. I placed these images into the box and I didn't go to the show. The curator called me that night. He said, Sheila, you have to come. I said, no, I don't have to come. I said, a picture speaks for itself. And he said, can you please come? I came. And when I got to the door, my heart was just panning because people were at the door and they wanted to know who I was. And this is and one of the images that I have on there was I was around the, the gun culture. I was around all of that. And they wanted to know, I don't have the image on here. I should have put it on here. An image of a, of, of a man with a gun. And it was my last shot because back then it was film. And I asked him to point the gun at me because I didn't know what else to do. He pointed that gun at me and he said, you want me to point this gun at you? And I said, yes. And, and he pointed that gun at me and I photographed it. And so going back to the people at the gallery, one thing that they wanted to ask me, did you ask him, did he have a bullet in the gun? And I said, no, I did not. And so this was my start into the world of photography and fine art photography. It wasn't until I went to, I was heading to California, but I, my sister called me and I actually moved to Atlanta. And my father, he saw the work that I was doing um, with imagery, photographs. And he said, it's something about this photography that you like, and I'm gonna put you through school. And he says, I'll pay for your school as long as you stay in Georgia. So I went to Georgia State and this is where I received my MFA, is at Georgia State in 2003. And so upon um, going to school, it really taught me how to think about my work more in a historical reference when I see the work, because when it came to what I was photographing, for example, um, Black males and rap culture, I did not realize about the Black body and how that Black body was looked upon very negatively. So I just said, oh, these are some cool shots. So that's what school taught me. So as I was in school, the work that you see before now is work called Plastic Bodies. I, this is actually my thesis coming out of grad school. I was really in, in my artistic practice, and I didn't know this at the time, I'm really interested in ordinary people and who, and the, cause they are the force behind what is trending and what is popular. And that's where my main focus is, well, it is now, to this day. And so with plastic bodies, I wanted to know how black women felt about their bodies because back in two, I say 2003, 2003, you had BET, you had the hip hop culture and the women and a lot of people that are not of the culture, they didn't understand it of, of, of women in, in their bodies because they have more of the lips, the breasts, the buttocks. And so I started going out talking to black women about how do they feel about this sexuality. And then in school, I started doing a lot of research about how, um, how did black bodies were looked upon women back in the 1800s to the 1900s? And I found uh, 
history about Sarah Barterman. She was from um, Africa. And when they, when Europeans came in and colonized, they were not used to the black body. And like I said, the, the lips, the buttocks, the breasts, it was a lot. So they brought Sarah Barterman back to Europe in a museum and they had her on show. And everybody was fascinated about that. And I was like, oh my God. So it made me understand how the black woman got their negative, um, what am I trying to say? Um, the stereotype of their bodies in a negative sense about their sexuality. And so from there, I started looking at the Barbie doll and I was like, wow, no woman <laughs> can really perceive the ideal body based on the Barbie doll. So I started morphing, digitally so, digitally collage, morphing Barbie dolls with girls, with girls. And if you, if you notice in the imagery, part of it is plastic and part of it is human. So I'm playing a fine line between reality and non-reality. And I've become kind of like the surgeon, surgeon and wanted to show you about, especially women of color, how their bodies are not defined um, when it comes to Western culture. So moving forward, coming out of school, my mind is always ticking. It's always ticking. It feels like I have to constantly do something. And I decided to go into suburbia. This is in 2006. And in 2006, in the contemporary art world, there was a lot of um, imagery coming out on suburbia, but I didn't see imagery of Black culture. I'm talking about the art world now. And in Atlanta, you have a large community of African-Americans um, that are doing well, that lives in, um, in these communities. And so I started pointing my camera towards that community versus what we constantly see in urban, in the media. In the media, we're constantly seeing the stereotypes uh, and the projection of urban America. And there's not enough contrast of African-Americans that are in suburbia. So my, my whole process was this was, I wanted to show the interiors of the homes. I didn't want you to really necessarily focus on the people. That's why within all of my work of this body of work called suburbia, I just want you to, to look at the work, it's like this woman is laying in bed and she's reading Business Week, the future of technology. And then she has her phone right there because this is the type of imagery that we don't see, that didn't see at the time when I was doing this body of work. And this is where I became national, uh, national with my work with this body of work called Suburbia. I won the, they called it back then, the Santa Fe Prize of, the, uh, of Photography. And I won, I won this prize and I was just totally shocked because I had to go to Santa Fe to talk about this work. I had to have um, um, editors, curators, um, consultants to look at the work and then they give me their feedback on this work. And what really shocked me, and as an artist, you never know how people are gonna perceive your work because I live like this. I was told that I didn't have enough like signifiers in the work to show that these um, that these were um, black homes, and it kind of puzzled me because I said we're living in the 21st century, and I was thinking about wow how a stereotype of one's culture can be ingrained in, in someone's unconsciousness, and when you're seeing the image, you don't believe it. And I was told by a publisher, he says, I grew up around Martha Luther King era and you don't have enough signifiers. And I was so puzzled and I said, what is it that you want to see? And I made a little joke out of it, like fried chicken, collard greens and um, 
watermelon, you know, because those are stereotypes when it comes to in, in, in the African-American culture. So my whole basis of, of doing this work is to show universal commonality amongst all of us. We all um, want the same things. Our skin color are, may, may be different, but we all are striving for the same things. So moving forward, in 2012, we had the tragedy of Trayvon Martin. And at that time, I was um, in my studio. Um, I, I had a body of work um, called Young Americans. And I don't have this on the screen. And Young Americans is a body of work because I really wanted to Think, I was thinking about the millenniums, the young people, what do they think about politics? Because at, at that time, people were like, young people don't know what they're talking about. They're just in their phones. And I'm like, I beg the different. But what happened was Trayvon Martin. And that took my attention to that. I started um, getting in touch with the unknown civil rights leaders that were in the movement in, in the civil rights and started talking to them because I wanted to try to understand what was going on myself. And because my parents did not talk to me about the civil rights movement. And when I started talking to Mr. Lonnie King, who started the Atlanta student movement here in Atlanta, I was like a little kid, like, oh my God, I didn't learn this in school. And I ran home to my mother and I said, mom, I said, why didn't you teach us about, tell us about the civil rights movement? She said, I didn't want you to hate white people. And I was like, oh. So I started, I felt that I needed to go to the ground for myself. And this is documentary work documentary, I'm moving from fine art to documentary. I felt that I needed to go and tell the story from my perspective. I started in Atlanta. I moved to, um, from there I went to Baltimore, um, Baltimore, Ferguson, Baton Rouge. I was like on the plane, off the plane with that. And it was amazing what I learned being on the ground with the young people. And I wanted to, with this body work, I didn't realize that this was gonna be a body work number one. I just wanted to go to the ground and find out what was um, going on. And so what happened was after all of that, we had George Floyd that happened around the pandemic. And I told myself, you know, I've been around the universities, Canada, London, everywhere talking about this work. This work is called 1960 Now. And I made it in a generation, or you're not going to see these images, of, of the elders that were in the movement that were unknown. I took portraits of them along with the young visionary activists are, that are in the now. And then you see my protest images. And... I think I was traumatized because I didn't want to go back out and shoot anymore because I felt that we as a country, as people, are we really listening to each other or do we really hear each other? So I started going back out to um, George Floyd and only I stayed in Atlanta. And these are some of the images that um, I photographed. And this is of um, Rachel Brooks that was um, shot down in Atlanta at the Burger King. And this is at Avernese Baptist Church. So these are the images and then Brianna, what happened to Brianna. And within all of my work, with this particular work, I shot it in black and white. I shot with the Leica cameras, the SL2 and the Q2 with these imagery. Because the early, earlier work, I was shooting with... Um, it wasn't Leica because I wasn't um, um, affiliated with Leica at the, at the time, but I've always liked Leica cameras and now I've had the opportunity to really um, photograph with the cameras and, and learn those cameras. So this is the imagery that I shot all in 2000 and 
20, when we were all, you know, in the pandemic, you know, a lot of stuff was going on. And what I focus when I go out is, it's not necessarily the, if you notice my, my images have so much of a, of a, of a silence or maybe a calmness to it, because I really want you to not just see these images. I want you to hear these women, hear these images. It's like Black Women Matter. And you have this young girl and this young man that are um, um, right by this Ferris wheel. And I believe this might be the grandmother. And she's asking, when will Mark Luther King Jr. dream come true? And this was at the Burger King, like God or else. Because one thing about within the African culture, even through back in the time of my ancestors being in slavery, the focal point was always God. And that's why, because it's like the culture is a very resistant culture where it's like their resistance to anything that they can overcome and with God, they can overcome with that. And that's what some of the stuff, if you notice, I focused on. And this is an image of a woman holding an American flag and reading the Bible. And this was at Rayshard Brooks' funeral. So those are the things that I focus on. I don't focus on the typical things of, of what the media um, focus on because I understand, uh, lack of better words, their agenda and what they're trying to do, but I'm focusing on the other. And I don't know if I said this earlier, the reason why I shot this in black and white is because it's like what has changed. And I felt at the time when I was doing this work, it's like, I can't shoot this until we make a change. It has to be in black and white. And that was my process with this body of work in its documentary. It's like we always matter. So moving forward to during the pandemic, um, I received a call from the Washington Post, um, one of the photo editors, and they wanted me to, it was not just me, but other photographers to talk about racism. And at that time I was just so burnt out. And I said, well, I really don't wanna talk about it. But if I do it, I want to start looking at the landscape, because if you think about it, when it comes to all of us, it's all about the land. And that's what we're actually fighting about is the land. And so I decided to go to Stone Mountain here in Atlanta, Georgia, because this is the site of the second coming of the KKK in 1915, where they went up to the mountain on Thanksgiving day and burned a cross and a Bible. And that's how it became re reunited is, is the second coming of that. And I really wanted to understand through looking at the land, how this power came about and why. And I started doing a lot of researching because there's a lot of myth and reality of the Southern South, you know, Southern South and looking and, I, and looking at the roots of, um, of, of the power of the, of the KKK. So it was really interesting because Stone Mountain Park is a beautiful, beautiful park. It's, it's, it's really calming, it's really peaceful. But as an African-American, and I, I was thinking about my parents because they came from the Jim Crow era and they're gone now. I can't talk to them about a lot of stuff. I wish I had the presence of mind to speak to my parents at that time. And so I really tell everyone, if you have parents, start talking to them about your history or whatever you wanna talk about. Cause once they're gone, you can't run home to mama and daddy and say, mom, dad, you know that. So with this imagery, I have to face as an African-American, the symbolism and what this symbolism represent. And these are the three Confederate soldiers um, on this carving stone, which is one of the largest granite stones in the country. And they still have the symbolism of, of the Confederate flag. And what was really interesting to me, they have um, plantations there and slave homes. 
And I thought this was real interesting because when I saw this image, I saw the cotton bud on the table where these slaves had to eat, okay, in, in that time period. And I wondered, would they have allowed them to have cotton on the table while they were eating? I thought that was really, really, very interesting with that. And like I said, the Bible plays a very important part in, I, I feel, in everybody's culture. And for um, the KKK to come up there, they were reading um, Romans chapter 12. And this image right here actually is something that I set up. My father, this is my father's book, because I wanted to really ask him a lot of questions, because how my father... Um, I was born in a little town called Wake House, Georgia, and that's where my parents grew up at. And they grew up around the Jim Crow laws. And I think about them all the time about how did they endure all of that? And this is my father's Bible because how he got, how he was able, how he was able to, um, how he got into the service was because they had to get him out of town. Because my father, he didn't care who he was. He would speak the truth. And they did not like that at all. So that's how he, he got into the service, believe it or not. And this is his Bible. And it made me think a lot about them as, as young people, as children, and even as a teenager, what they had to deal with. And this, in the Bible, is chapter 12 of what, um, the KKK read when they re um, the second coming of, of that. And like I said, this mountain is, is very, very beautiful. And it's through the lens, and I wanted to show the, the, the southern landscapes of this mountain through the lens of photography. And I wanted to, it's like you see these are quiet moments again. I want you to think about this. There's, there's history about this mountain, this history about the Confederacy, and really think about, you know, doing re research. I've done a lot of research, and a lot of stuff that I did not know that really baffled me away. And I actually named, since this is not documentary, I actually named um, a lot of this work, work. This is like, I can't breathe. And I was really thinking about when I was on the ground, when I was doing this work, work, and what informed me. And the reason why I shot this in black and white, because black and white has a part of, I don't want to say romanticism, but actually truth too. And I wanted to show that in this last image um, that, I'm, that you're looking at right now, I was thinking about the future. There is a future. How can we, into society, move forward together? You know, with this. So this is called "There Is a Future." I shot all of this in, in black and white, of course, and I used the SL and the M10 with this work. And I have this body of work. I received a commission in 2000, and yeah, and yeah, during the pandemic, where the High Museum of Art here in Atlanta commissioned me out. They have what you call um, uh, a commission that they give photographers every two years. And it's called Picturing the South. And I was one of the artists along with another woman, Asian and a, a male photographer. And it was a part of a bigger body of work of 16 artists. And it showed last year up into the first of this year. And it was really amazing to see the different perspectives of how people saw the South. And this is called Invisible Empire. And how I actually came up with the um, title is, I, I do a lot of reading. I actually do a lot of reading. And I was reading W.E.D. Boyce, a scholar that was um, at the HCBUs back in the 1900s. And he talked about how Georgia is so beautiful, yet on its beauty rests something disturbing and strange. And that's how I came up with Invisible Empire, with this body of work. 
And so moving forward with that, like I was telling you, I'm always, I'm always thinking, and it's like I'm I'm thinking in my practice, I'm always listening, observing, and doing research. And I really never thought that I would actually start photographing the landscape. And I said, well, maybe this is my next step. So I started thinking more about the land. I started thinking about the black farmers because ever since um, the pandemic and we all been kind of like bound to our homes and we couldn't move, it really took me a seat back about what's really important to me. And like I said, I started looking at the farmers and I started thinking about food. Food is going to be very, very important to all of us. And I feel that we, well, for me, is that I need to learn how to grow the food. And so this body of work is a work in progress. Um, I received a, a, a grant from the Athamath project with this body of work, and it's called the Land of Blood and Dirt. I met two. Um, I met two farmers, a, a son and a father, in in Ellen, Georgia. It's in Atlanta, but it's kind of like like thirty mile, thirty miles or twenty miles outside of Atlanta. And the name of the um, farm is called Atlanta Harvest. They're wanting to teach people how to grow food grow their own food and they're having a market. They have a market where people could come and buy the food. And especially within urban America, this is like a food desert. So this is their way of coming, but it's for everybody. It's just not for African-Americans. And so I started doing research about the USDA and, and the black farmers, and of course about the discrimination. And I felt with this body of work, it was about bringing in black joy. It's about transforming, you see this on his shirt, transforming the hood for, for good. Now you see living color <laughs> with my, with my image, imagery. And some of it is conceptual. You, I um, use death of fill a lot with this body of work where you'll see images of individuals in, in the back, but I'm focusing you onto this grapevine that they have there. And I'm showing you how their processes and what they're growing. They're using, they said beyond organic is going back to the old ways of how to cultivate the land and make it organic. And it's, I'm telling you everybody, it's really nice to really um, see the process. I'm still in the, pro they're still in the process. I believe they bought 15 acres of land and you see some of the, um, the individuals that's on the land. And, and one day I was hungry. I think I was out there for about three or four hours and I was hungry. They said, well, why don't you just pick up one of the leaves and eat that, you'll be okay. And I did, <laughs> you know, and it's really good, you know? And you see the brother right there with him doing that. And I want you to feel like you're walking into, into this and into this. And this is this one is taken really recently because we've been, you know how climate change and, and the weather is, is not the same. And this is some of the um the the um the not the grass, but you know what I'm talking about. With the, they they're growing, they're growing everything, like green onions, collard greens. Um, I can't even think right now. So that is my story about how I come about with my bodies of work. And what's important for me is to show, like I keep saying, it's about the ordinary people. It's not about the celebrity. It's about the majority of the people and how they live and try to so show something special um, with them. Because I always tell people, even going back to my 1960 now, and even the work that I did with um, Invisible Empire, talking about white supremacy, I always say to everyone, if you can't see, we always talk about love and I <laughs> love. And I said, if you can't see the beauty and justice in this, we have no love at all. And I'm gonna end with that. And this is 
the father. I forgot I had that last image. This is the father of the farm. The young sons are learning from their father. That's all really, a, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, and he has, that, he has that prayer moment like mm -hmm. praying that goes yeah. back to the culture. Yeah. Um, I knew <laughs> I was going to be moved, but I wasn't, I'm a little, whew. I'm a little like, yeah, I, I don't have a lot of words because you have shared so much in just such a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So James has a comment. He says, the saying that photographers can only photograph who they are, um, he says that you bring that statement to life. Um, Thank you. Which, you know, it's definitely, it's inspiring. I've seen a lot of imagery, especially un with the unfortunate situations we've had really right. highlighted in the past couple of years and um mm -hmm. it just hearing like your story along with the images really does make an impact sorry <laughs> yeah, i'm um, sorry i don't want to make people to cry but i like i said i want people to really understand you know oh. because we all live in this world and how can we come together you know if we can you know i, right. I understand but try to undercut because you know what we really don't know each other we kind of know each other through the media or yeah. these sources but we really don't know each other and and that's what I try to bring light in my work in my practice and when I do the shoot shooting because I'm very concerned about communities and shared communities too well I mean like even just thinking about the work that you're working on right now and that farm and communities coming together to make that happen because I've seen stories over the years too. There's so many neighborhoods that don't have access to healthy food, good mm -hmm. food, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I've seen other, right. I've heard others, some other stories of like these small <laughs> community farms coming together to help bring that mm -hmm. to these neighborhoods that, you know, don't have it right. for a variety of reasons, right? Um, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, no, I mean, just like, I know I'm inspired without a doubt. Um, I think one of the challenges that some people face potentially is, is trying to find that, that part of their life that they connect with. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I think you made a really good point, like having the conversations with your parents or your grandparents, or your great grandparents, if you can do that to right. like learn some of that history from them because a lot of history that you know we want to be able to know about like you said we didn't learn about you know in school or um you know in those different in books and things like that now we have a lot more opportunity um and there's going to be even more as we kind of take a dive in and all of that um but yeah like i'm because uh, I, I think that it's really a good time for creators, you know, yeah. I, I think we're going to be the moving force to where we're going to lead the country with this. And because, you know, everybody is visual. We don't really read a lot now. So right. people can <laughs> unfortunately, tell the story. yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> if people could read, people could um, start sharing their stories from their perspective, you know? Yes. So I have Jim, who is um, a local here in the Seattle area, and he does have mm -hmm. a question. Um, there haven't okay. been, there's a couple of questions in here now, so I'm going to take a, a moment to um, get into some of these questions. Sorry, as I like. Okay. <laughs> Oh, no, no crazy. I'm sorry. I don't mean, I didn't mean You're, that. You have nothing to apologize for. This is just, um, <laughs> this is me being emotional because a lot of what you shared, you know, I'm from Atlanta. I grew up in the Southeast. Okay. Um, I, okay. you know, I feel like I've known some of the stories, but there was also a lot that I didn't get to learn. Um, and mm -hmm. some of that's from school and all of that. So anyhow, um, we won't digress into that. Let's get into some of these questions that are coming in now. 
Okay. Okay. So from from Devin, uh, who actually is working here with me today, uh, he he's mm -hmm. one of our lighting experts and a general awesome person. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So everything you've shared, there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of story. How do you decompress or recover or take care of yourself when you are capturing these stories of such, you know, intense struggles racially and all of that in our country? Yeah, that's that, that's a very important question. And um, what I do, because it seems like I work a lot, but I, I spoke upon um, when the pandemic came, it really took me a sit back to really, to think about a lot of things, what was important to me and about self-care because this will traumatize you a lot. And to be honest with you, I didn't realize how traumatized that I was when I was doing, especially the body of work of 1960. And then I moved into Invisible Empire, how it actually took a toll on me. But I feel that these stories have to be told because we can't, we have to face it. I believe that, um, I can't think of his name. We said we, it's everything, we can't change everything, but we need to face it. So when it comes to me, my self care is I'm a very private person. You don't see me a lot on Instagram or Facebook and doing a lot of stuff. It's just that I'm in solitude. I'm with my family. Family is so important. I lost my father and mother, not during the pandemic, and all of my elders are, are gone. So I am really wanting to know, learn more about that and be with family, because I feel family is it's family with everybody is so important right now. If you don't understand it now, I'm just saying family is so important. So I decompress with my family and have fun. Okay. Well, it's important to do that, you know. Um, they, especially, you know, it feels a little more intense after the past couple of years with the pandemic on top of all of this other stuff happening in our country. Yeah, um, and it keeps happening, you know? So yeah. um, it's perpetual. So we have to find some kind of space for us, whatever that is that works for you, right. you know, because it is intense, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Stan says the strengths of your visual statements come through especially well in black and white, which is probably why you've chosen black and white for so many of those stories. Um, I know you're in the process of working on um, the current series, which I've, <laughs> the, it's Blood and, um, the Blood and Dirt. Yeah. Blood and it's Dirt, that's name. right. So sorry. Um, do you <laughs> okay. have any inklings about what your next project might be? Or do you think you're going to be on this one for a bit? Oh gosh, um, I, got so many. <laughs> I, I, I feel that to really flesh this out, it's going to take me a year or so with this project. Mm. You know, I'm just getting to know the family, the land, yeah. and I think it, it it's going to take me a while for this. But along besides that, I've been approached by people with commissions and stuff. People are commissioning me out to do work. So it's taken me into different places and, and challenging me. So while I'm working on the land of blood and dirt, I would be doing, I'm doing um, a few commissions and talks and stuff like that. Well, it's probably good to have some variety, you know, and interest too, right? Right, right, right. Um, okay, so Jim, so Jim is asking, with all that you've seen and the images you have made, do you see images changing how we think and feel or cutting through some of the misinformation that's out there? I think it can, but if we continue to show the same type of imagery that we see in the media, yeah, you know, our minds are really stimulated with imagery. And a lot of, a lot of my, um, I, I think a lot of my imagery, and I'm gonna use the farm, that's not hip, okay? <laughs> we wanna see hip stuff. So right. I'm trying to rewire, <laughs> rewire our minds and, and start looking at a different way of seeing if I can. And that's what I'm doing. And it's not easy as an artist, but right. um, that is my goal to do that. I don't want to create the same type of imagery or the same type, type of look 
that everybody's doing. I want to do an alternative to this. And to be honest with you, shooting the farm is very challenging to me because part of it may look documentary, part of it may look um, like this image right here is conceptual. So I'm going back and forth and playing with that because right. I don't want it too documentary, but I want people to think when they see this imagery too. Right. Yes. And that's what I'm trying is that I feel that we need to re rewire our minds and how we see and view imagery. Yes. But it's going to take us image makers to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, let's hear. So the photographs that you're creating in this series, for instance, um, are you able to use like is the farm able to use these images or um, are there benefits that you're sharing out with them to help kind of like spread the word per se about yeah. the farm and all of that <laughs> like getting the word <laughs> out but in an artistic I, kind of way yeah. <laughs> I actually have this is the first time I've actually talked about this work and the first time that I posted on my um IG. Okay. I'm going to start because I'm, I'm thinking of something bigger and I'm thinking about NFTs, which I talked to one of to, 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 to the son of the father. Yeah. And we're going to see if we can make something like that happen and make it international and yeah. the money that received for that because they have a not they need they, they need funds. Right. And so they have a nonprofit organization where that money would go to them. So that's what we're working on. Could you do me a favor and send me the yeah. link to that one of these days? Like, if you think about it today, send me the link to that so that I can help or and we can help. Okay, with, share, with spread the, the word. With the, with, with, the <laughs> not, with the nonprofit organization. Yeah. And then their IG is Atlanta Harvest. The Atlanta IG, Harvest. If you okay. Call it. Yeah, Atlanta Harvest. Yeah. It's funny that. Um, I haven't lived in Atlanta since 2006, so it's. Um, okay. That's when <laughs> I went back came and visit. To Atlanta in, two, in 2000, I came to Atlanta, so oh, we just missed know, each other. That was, um, <laughs> yeah. So yes, let's see if we can make something happen. I'm really excited about this, and it's a really a big challenge for me too. You know, it's really a big challenge. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, um, I'm super grateful. For hearing the stories along with the images the images are obviously powerful on their own but hearing the stories with it um you know people are also commenting in the chat room that you know they see you they see the images it's resonating with them as well um so okay. i just uh, want to take a moment to express my gratitude for your time and for Leica. Mike, I know you're in the chat room with us. Uh, Mike Meza is <laughs> with Leica. He's been hanging out there. Um, and so we're just super grateful for this opportunity to have you here with us today, even though we're thousands of miles apart. <laughs> oh, that, uh, that's fine. <laughs> do, you have, yeah. do you have anything else that you wanted to share? And then I think we would probably wrap the session up here. No, I mean, if anybody want to know, anything about my practice or the the photographs or anything like that. I mean, as far as the technical end, I can answer that. Someone okay. would like to know that. Yeah. Those kinds of questions haven't been coming in, which um, in a, oh, I think is great. I think it's been great that everything's been focused on, on the work and, the work um, and your process. Yeah. yeah. I mean, of course we know that, um, you know, cause you mentioned the cameras that you're using with Leica and, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I can see how uh, those have played a part in, in the work and they were all just really beautiful. Um, so there's just uh, gratitude coming in from the chat room. People who, like I said, they, they see the work, they see you, they hear you. Um, it's resonating with them, um, what you've shared with us today. Um, okay. And then I will, I what's, is there, is there a best place for folks to like follow you? Is Instagram kind of the place? I know you said you're not super active there, but um, yeah, I'm, I think I need to start getting super active, especially with the <laughs> new body of work that I'm doing. Yeah. So follow me. On, uh, yeah, follow me on IG, um, she pre bright, and I post occasionally on Facebook, but IG would be my platform. Yeah. Yes. And I'll share the link to that in the um, 
in the chat um, so that people can just go ahead and give you a quick follow. I also shared the Instagram, I think, for Atlanta Harvest. So if you want to follow them, uh, oh, yeah. take a peek follow at what they got too. going on. And maybe if you can Bye. lend a little support their way uh, to help them uh, support the community there, that would be really awesome. Um, yeah, that'd be, uh, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, Sheila and Laika, thank you so much for your time today. For everyone who joined us today, um, if you want to rewatch this, this will be available at least through the weekend. Um, and stay tuned for more events coming up with Glazers. We have another live event this afternoon at 1 p.m. Uh, featuring Sigma Photographer and lots more programming uh, throughout the week. So I will bid you all goodbye for now, and we'll see you back online later. Sheila, thank you again. And thank you, and thank you. <laughs> Take care. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh -huh,